All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Deshaun Yapagandara. I work in the Ditzler Lab at NASA Ames Research Center under Dr. Milena Popovich. Uh, today I'll be talking about the vesicle and the water and oil transfer method and what it means for the origin of life here on Earth. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Uh, so what is a vesicle, first of all? So a vesicle is an aqueous solution that's surrounded by amphiphilic lipids that form in a bilayer. Uh, the lipid's amphiphilic because it has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts, the hydrophilic part being the hydrophilic head, of course, uh, with the negative charge on the phosphate group allowing it to hydrogen bond with the surrounding water. Uh, the hydrophobic tail is actually really insoluble in water because it has a lot of uh, nonpolar elements, so it doesn't really uh, work too well in water. So when we uh, introduce these lipids into solution, they're actually able to spontaneously form into vesicles. And uh, if you look to the left, you'll actually see what it looks like with our, uh, uh, our vesicles. We have the hydrophilic heads pointing towards solution in, both in and out. And then you can actually see uh, vesicles that I've actually made uh, earlier this year that are uh, introduced with tetramonium salt dye, which can actually complex with sodium and fluoresce. So uh, it's... Uh, able to, uh, we're able to introduce many different facets of cellular machinery and chemical elements into our vesicles itself. Sorry, real quick, am I still screen sharing? It keeps on popping up and down. I'm not sure if that's working. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So anyways, for the vesicles and the origin of life. So first off, we can use vesicles as models for protocells and monitor their behavior of what we thought they could have acted as. And uh, the main reasons why protocells were so advantageous in the uh, primordial world is they're able to spontaneously form, like I said before. So they're readily available in the primordial soup. And they provided a semi-permeable membrane, which allows them to control the uptake of nutrients and also uh, secrete waste uh, whenever necessary. And the third thing is they're able to concentrate solutes and create gradients between the outer world and the inner world, which is actually really important for things like respiration in the future. So there's, but before we can get into how uh, important vesicle or protocells were, we need to understand where these amphiphiles came from. And two interesting hypotheses that I thought were really cool was that amphiphiles could have come from uh, meteorites and crash landed into Earth, uh, into the ocean, and actually uh, slowly turned into vesicles spontaneously. This was uh, introduced by Dr. David Deemer of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he used the uh, Murchison meteorite, one of, a one of the most prominent uh, meteorite samples that's still used today. Uh, he took some mixed amphiphiles from the, uh, from the Murchison meteorite and uh, dissolved them in solution, and they formed vesicle-like structures. Uh, another one is that the deep sea vents were actually able to concentrate amphiphiles in specific conditions and promote the formation of vesicles, which uh, makes sense, but we also have to understand how or which type of uh, of uh, deep sea vent. Here you'll actually see a white smoker and a black smoker. There's a lot of debate between which one actually uh, came about. But they both uh, uh, agree that uh, deep sea vents were able to uh, concentrate the amount of amphiphiles in the ocean. Uh, so what are the benefits for the uh, water and oil transfer method? So first off, uh, it's simple and fast. It takes less than one and a half hours to form your product and you can get onto something else or whatever, whatever else you're using vesicles for in your research. So the ability to protect this expensive cellular machinery is also another important thing and uh, other chemical substances because of how stable our membrane is. We call this the encapsulation efficiency. Uh, the other thing that's most important is, I, to me is that you can control the inner and outer leaflet positions. Uh, which means that you can change what type of amphiphiles introduced, maybe a different uh, hydrophilic head, or maybe you want to intru introduce a single chain amphiphile, meaning it only has one tail. Uh, you have full control over that, and you can change that in both the uh, inner leaflet here and the outer leaflet here. Uh, you can also change the sizes of your vesicles by introducing different shear forces into your sample, and also the lamellarity. Uh, the water and oil transfer method actually produces unilamellar vesicles, uh, which is most pertinent to origin of life research. So this is actually the diagram and the flowchart that we use for our research, but the main materials you'll need are sucrose and glucose, which uh, are here to actually balance out the concentrations of the inner and outer solutions of our vesicles to prevent any diffusion. Uh, water, of course, in our as our aqueous solvent. Paraffin, which is a mineral oil. Uh, we can use this as a way to uh, solubilize our lipid and create a two-phase separation in the Few, set next few parts of our uh, 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 protocol. Uh, 
And then we have our lipid, of course, that being POPC. Uh, it's a very commonly used lipid and readily available. And then, uh, so I'll go ahead and explain how we get, uh, go about doing this. We take our POPC and our paraffin and we heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius in the same beaker, uh, allowing it to solubilize and also remove any chloroform that the POPC was actually uh, dissolved in. Uh, chloroform is obviously dangerous for human beings, so we have to heat it up. We then take our lipid oil and we transfer it to our inner solution containing a microfuge tube and ha uh, homogenize it for roughly 10 to 12 seconds. Oh, and I also forgot a key part. We have to cool down our lipid oil to 22 degrees Celsius prior to use. That's key. I'll explain that in a bit. And then we take our emulsion from our homogenized mixture and we transfer it over to our outer solution containing glucose. Uh, then we can centrifuge uh, the sample at 18,000 RCF for roughly 10 minutes and we get a pellet of vesicles. Essentially what these next few centrifugation steps that I'm about to explain uh, remove any lipid aggregates that didn't form into vesicles uh, through our protocol. So then we go ahead and resuspend our pellet and transfer it to another outer solution, which helps with the cleaning again, the removing of the lipid aggregates. We do that at 9,000 RCF for five minutes this time. And then we get our pellet of vesicles again, we resuspend it and transfer it over to our uh, final sample where we can use this for pretty much anything regarding uh, vesicle research. Uh, we actually used it for optical microscopy to see how uh, high quality our vesicles were. So one thing that we were really uh, curious about was how can we make the best quality vesicles? And uh, we believe that the two main variables that really uh, help in making great vesicles is temperature of the lipid oil prior to homogenization and also the homogenization time. And what we noticed in the past before even like checking all this out for other research is that when uh, our lipid oil was warm to the touch, we got cleaner vesicles. And then uh, we decided to actually test this out with uh, what I'm presenting right now. And uh, another thing that we did was we took uh, homogenization time. So what we wanted to see was essentially uh, how much, how fat or how long should we homogenize to get perfectly uniform vesicles? And uh, the downside to doing that though is that we get more lipid aggregates. So what we were looking for was a sweet spot between temperature and homogenization time to get the most high quality vesicles. And uh, what we found out was that by mapping this uh, temperature and energy parameter space for the vesicles, we were able to notice that higher temperatures and higher homogenization times actually resulted in uh, no vesicles being formed. And when we went to, uh, for a low temperature and uh, our low temperature and uh, high homogenization, we had really uh, terrible vesicles that formed way too many lipid aggregates. What we eventually found was that at 22 degrees Celsius for our lipid oil and 10 to 12 seconds roughly for our homogenization time, uh, we formed the best vesicles. And when I mean best, we have very few lipid aggregates and uh, relatively sized vesicles. Uh, on the right, you can actually see one of our samples from uh, January where we were actually able to get very few uh, lipid aggregates and very, a very large amount of unilamellar vesicles. In one of our samples actually, uh, rough in last year actually, we got 1.83 billion vesicles in a 365 microliter sample. And with such a large amount of vesicles, we can use it for quantitative research and qualitative research alike, uh, pertaining to not only the origin of life, but also for other things in synthetic biology and uh, biomedical research. But overall, having a protocol that's easy to work with produces a large concentration of vesicles and allows us to pursue other facets of uh, origin of life research is really interesting. And uh, in the future, I'll be working on more origin of life research oriented stuff. And I can't wait to present my research in the coming months. Uh, so I'd like to say a few thank yous now. First off to my PI, uh, Dr. Melina Popovich. Uh, she gave me a chance to pursue my passion and I couldn't be more grateful. Like uh, I've done so much in my short time here at Ames and uh, it feels like a dream every day that I get to drive out to uh, NASA Ames and just work with such a great amount of people. And then I'd also like to say thank you to Blue Marble, uh, also Sanjoy. Uh, Sanjoy gave me a lot of mentorship at the beginning of my uh, career, not career, I guess, my internship here at Ames and uh, a lot of headers. And also he introduced me to a lot of interesting people. And uh, being able to work on the same floor as a lot of people like the Ross Child Lab is it's a blessing, being able to work with people that send research up to the International Space Station. I couldn't ask for more. So thank you so much to everybody. And this is my work cited. Yeah, thank you. And now I can take any questions.
Thank you, Deshan. Uh, the floor is open for Deshan, if anybody has any questions. How do I stop sharing? There. Okay. No questions? Deshan, in what, so I guess the, 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 it's the initial step that, I, that I'm still confused about. How, where do fatty acids come from in the environment that could then self-assemble to form cells? Uh, well, for our specific research, we didn't really use fatty acids. Uh, we used a different type of lipid. It was a really simple one. It was a double chain amphiphile. But for fatty acids in the uh, origin of life, uh, the only perceived one that I've read from Dave Deemer is that it came from meteorites. Uh, that's also pronounced in the other hypothesis that I gave because I noted that it was concentrated in deep sea vents, but it's still a question as to where these are made. And even then when we say they come from carbonaceous meteorites, we don't necessarily know how they're formed. So still a really interesting question to make, but we don't necessarily know how they're made specifically in space. It's interesting because if they come as meteorites, they'll probably be very diffuse, you know, after impact. Like, mm -hmm. How do they get back together and reconcentrate in a way that can form? I think it's just because so many crash landed into Earth that there had to be at least a, a small enough probability to form a few. And over time, the deep sea vents could have concentrated in them and created a large amount of them for them to just mingle with each other and uh, make these vesicles, or protocells, excuse me. Through that time is not really a problem. There's plenty of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's ah, fascinating stuff. I wonder if the pores within the hydrothermal chimneys mm -hmm. could have served as templates for those protocells. Absolutely, especially with the concentration of them. Exactly, Absolutely. and the, the gradients mm -hmm. of a pH and electron charge and so on. Fascinating mm -hmm. stuff, really cool. Uh, any other questions for Deshan? If not, then thank you very much for right, your presentation, you Deshan. Appreciate it.